This will be the 36th presentation in the continuing series entitled Visions of the Kingdom Age. This presentation will address that subtle divine timestamp of delivering the prophet Ezekiel's second cherubim vision exactly 420 days after the first, and how this projects the second immortalization in the Creator's plan at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. In our previous class, we began to consider the prophet Ezekiel's three cherubim visions. <clears throat> we observed the three very particular time stamps for these visions and identified those three visions with the three immortalization events in the Creator's plan. Let's continue these vision time stamp considerations. Ezekiel's first vision is experienced physically by the river Kibar while in Babylonian captivity. This is defined as the 30th year, the fourth month, and the fifth day, but cross-referenced as being the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. This would be the fifth year from Judah's first deportation to Babylon. The second deportation following the rebellion of King Zedekiah was still many years away. We know this, <clears throat> we know this first vision was 20 years before the prophet's third cherubim vision, and that third cherubim vision was experienced 50 years to the day from the great Passover and national repentance under King Josiah. Therefore, there are a couple possibilities to be considered as to why God would offer this 30th year timestamp for Ezekiel's first cherubim vision. Well, first, it would be uh, 30 years from that same point of reference of that great national repentance and Passover uh, under King Josiah. But the significance of the 30th year throughout our Heavenly Father's written testimony does emphasize a spiritual and physical maturity that assigns a level of responsibility. The priests and the Levites during the first kingdom age would serve beginning at the age of 30 <coughs> and continue for 20 years, which of course was the time frame for between Ezekiel's first and last cherubim visions. Therefore, it would be an interesting parallel in understanding how Ezekiel may have been personally 30 years old at that first cherubim vision, and it would be 20 years to his third and last vision, and the conclusion of his prophetic assignment. We read in Numbers chapter 4 of this 30-year assignment, uh, Starting in verse 2, take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, after their families and by the house of their fathers, from 30 years old and upward, even until 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation among the most holy things. The priests came from the Levite division. Of the Kohathites. Additionally, God states that anyone serving the tabernacle would begin at 30 years old. Further, we read in Numbers 4, uh, further down the chapter, verse 46, all those that were numbered among uh, of the Levites, whom Moses and Aaron and the chief of Israel numbered, all their families after the house of their fathers, from 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, Every one that came to do the service of the ministry and the service of the burden in their tabernacle of the congregation. This 30th year service appointment parallels the experience of Joseph, who was 30 when he was raised out of prison and exalted to the second highest political office, to glory and to wealth and privilege. Joseph died at 110 years old, 80 years after his appointment as Pharaoh's second in command. King David began to reign when he was 30 years old, after the death of Saul and Jonathan, reigning for a total of 40 years. Jesus began his ministry at the age of 30. Undoubtedly, he had exhibited significant spiritual wisdom and control before that age. I mean, even at the age of 12, he was dumbfounding the elite and enlightened community teachers at Jerusalem at the temple. But 30 was the age God appointed for Jesus to begin his ministry. The 30-year time step of Ezekiel's prophecy <clears throat> may refer to his age, as Ezekiel was 
a priest. We see this at the very beginning of his book. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest. Um, in that 30-year yeah, I'm sorry, if that 30-year timestamp does identify the age of Ezekiel the priest, just beginning his priesthood appointment, but without a temple at which to serve, then this would mean that Ezekiel was born in the year of Josiah's great Passover and national repentance. Let's remember that the cherubim vision projects the immortalization of Jesus Christ, and also, by extension, the saints. At the point of Christ's earthly glorification through the saints, the Jewish people will correspondingly experience their greatest and final national repentance, following that great Passover substance when the faithful will escape death forever at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. Additionally, the immortalized faithful will begin their new priesthood appointment as immortal priests, but they, hopefully we, will not serve only 20 years but for a thousand years, as we read in Revelation 20, uh, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in that first resurrection, on such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Of course, when it says the first resurrection, it means the first of the two resurrections of the saints, because Christ will have already been raised from the dead two thousand years before. So, these prophetic vision timestamps demonstrate a comprehensive and not a selective application, more of a three-dimensional harmony to the rest of our Creator's testimony. Additionally, we see how Ezekiel experiences this first cherubim vision while physically in Babylonian captivity, and then for the second and third cherubim visions being spiritually transported to Jerusalem. Now, these geographic distinctions blend with several scriptural patterns. In the same pattern, <clears throat> the first of the three immortalizations in our Creator's schedule takes place when Israel is under foreign control, under Rome's political authority, when Jesus Christ is immortalized, when he becomes the substance casting that first cherubim shadow, which serves as the template for the next two cherubim visions and the next two immortalizations. <clears throat> Let's remember that those next two cherubim visions have the prophet being spiritually transported to Jerusalem. In similar fashion, the next two immortalizations in the Creator's plan will not be at a time when the nation of Israel is under foreign control, as the time limit for the Gentile domination of Jerusalem ended in 1967. It will again appear, or when it appears, uh, as if the Jewish people may lose control again at that Gogian invasion, Christ and the immortalized saints will save them, serving as that substance, casting that second cherubim shadow vision when Ezekiel is first transported in spirit to Jerusalem. Therefore, why do we have this 420-day wait from the first cherubim vision to the second cherubim vision? We can start <clears throat> by examining the scriptural patterns identified with the number 42 as 420 is simply 10 times 42, and, and 10 is the full range of the basic decimal structure of our numbering system, 0 through 9. 10 is a complete set. But then again, so is the number 42, as demonstrated repeatedly through divine testimony. The scriptural patterns in the number 42 indicate a partial completion, but not a full completion. It's a completion, but it's, it's only a partial completion. Probably the most prominent <coughs> example that springs to mind is the three and a half years, the 42 months of our Messiah's ministry. From his baptism in the Jordan River to the substance casting the baptism ritual shadow in his death and resurrection 42 months later. Jesus certainly finished that first salvation stage, but it's still incomplete, as the plan is not finished. We remember his death with the memorial bread and wine, as well as joining him in a baptismal death that confirms the Father's righteousness in demanding death for sin in Eden. We have been reconciled, past tense, but only reconciled by our Messiah's death. We also need to be saved, 
future, by his life. Jesus will return to complete that process. But again, only partially, the first of the two salvation events for the saints will take place at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom, which is projected in that second cherubim vision. I would suggest this is why there is a specifically a 420-day wait from the first uh, cherubim vision to the second. That first cherubim vision primarily projects the immortalization of Jesus Christ, but also serves as the template, naturally, uh, for all three immortalization events in the Creator's plan. Uh, we also know there are four, 42 generations between Abraham and Jesus, as explained by Matthew. It is 42 generations from the promises of Abraham to the Messiah himself. That's a completion, but only a partial completion, because Abraham and his plural seed, both sets of that seed, his descendants by genealogy and his descendants by faith, have not yet been saved. There is a complete incompletion scripturally identified with this number 42. Now, it's, it's fairly easy to clearly identify the second cherubim vision with the second immortalization event in the Creator's plan uh, for several reasons. Uh, the first reason we already covered in the previous presentation, highlighting how Ezekiel witnesses the destruction of Jerusalem by the six that came, come from the north just before he witnesses the cherubim again. This perfectly parallels how the immortalized Christ and the saints will be seen on the Mount of Olives to save Jerusalem from the Gogian gang of six from the north that will be butchering the Jewish people, as described in Ezekiel 38, 39, and also in Zechariah chapters 12 through 14. It's highly appropriate that the end of that, uh, that at the end of that second cherubim vision, described at the end of chapter 11, sees the cherubim settle on the mount to the east of the city, which can only mean the Mount of Olives. The vision waits at the Mount of Olives for that time when the substance casting that shadow prophecy is to be revealed in that exact same location. Now, the time frame for these first and second cherubim visions is defined as 420 days. Another uh, identification of that second cherubim vision with the second immortalization event is the cry, O wheel, reported by Ezekiel in chapter, chapter 10. Now, the Hebrew word is galgal, from which the name Gilgal is derived, referring to that first encampment of the enlightened community in the Promised Land under Joshua's leadership. God named that place Gilgal, meaning to roll, because the reproach of Israel had been rolled away due to that first circumcision in the Promised Land after an absence of 40 years without circumcising. We read in Joshua chapter 5, beginning at verse 8, And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. Therefore, since there is a powerful reference to the rolling away of reproach emphasized in the second cherubim vision, this is a further validation for understanding that second cherubim vision to have an application to the second immortalization and not the first. The only negative aspect of our Messiah was that he was born with the same sin-cursed nature as ourselves, but that assigns no level of guilt whatsoever, just a necessary cleansing. We are the ones that hope to have the reproach of our transgressional sins rolled away when the flesh nature is cut away, circumcised, in the immortalization process at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. Therefore, the cry, O wheel, 
would be appropriate in the context of the immortalization of the saints, but not the immortalization of the Savior, as shadowed in that first cherubim vision. Additionally, that first encampment in the Promised Land, where the reproach of the enlightened community was rolled away, happens to be the 42nd encampment since leaving Egypt. There were exactly 42 encampments of the enlightened community between leaving the leaving of their Egyptian slavery to the first encampment in the Promised Land at Gilgal. Those 40 years from the first circumcision in Egypt and that first Passover under Moses to the next circumcision and that Passover in the Promised Land under Joshua is a prophetic snapshot of the time between our Messiah's death and resurrection and the substance casting that second circumcision and Passover in the second immortalization event when the saints will be saved at the beginning of the millennial kingdom under the greater Joshua, Jesus, which is, of course, the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua. Therefore, the 42 encampments between the first and second national circumcisions, those Passovers, can be directly paralleled to the 420 days between the first Caribbean vision and the second. This also fits the understanding of being only a partial completion. <laughs> yes, Israel entered the Promised Land, but that kingdom was only the first kingdom age. That first kingdom age would end when the Romans destroyed the nation and dispersed the Jewish people to all nations in 135 of the Common Era under the Roman Emperor Hadrian after the Bar Kochba revolt. The restored kingdom that we will that we wait for will not be defeated and will extend to the entire planet, to all nations. That is the completeness we await. I think this is why that 42 distinction is multiplied by 10 in the timestamp between the first and second Caribbean visions, projecting the time frame between the first two of the three immortalizations in the Creator's plan. Another example of the same 42 pattern would be the 42 months between the early and latter reigns of the prophet Elijah. James tells us how the famine Elijah successfully prayed for extended over a period of three years and six months. In other words, 42 months, just like the ministry of Jesus, just like the 42 encampments between the Egyptian uh, slavery and the inheriting of the promised land, <clears throat> and just like the 42 generations between Abraham and Jesus. We read in James 5, uh, beginning in verse 17, Elijah was a man of subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly <clears throat> that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now let's put this in the context of what James said a few verses earlier about how the early and latter rains define the first and second comings of Jesus Christ. In verse 7 of the same chapter, <clears throat> James advises us, and I'll quote it, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, meaning the farmer, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. So James identifies the return of Jesus Christ to the arrival of the latter rains that brings the blessing of extreme agricultural bounty. This is exactly how the second immortalization in the Creator's plan is referenced in Hosea's chapter, a prophecy in chapter 3. After Hosea prophesies of that promised healing, reviving, and raising up after two days, meaning two divine days, 2,000 years, he confirms this understanding of the timing <clears throat> between the first and second immortalization events as receiving the latter rains. We read in Hosea 6, and let's just read uh, verse 3 um, for, that, for our emphasis. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come to us unto us as the rain, 
as the latter and former reign unto the earth. <clears throat> Jesus, <clears throat> of course, is the he that represents Yahweh in this prophecy, Emmanuel. Uh, he will come to us twice. The first time he will come will be as the early reign, was as the early reign, that planting reign. He will come again as the latter reign, the harvest reign. Therefore, the 42 months between the early reign that stopped because Elijah prayed and the latter reign, when Elijah prayed again for the rains to come, is a prophetic shadow, time stamp, indicating the time between the two comings of our Messiah, between those two immortalizations, between those two cherubim visions with that 420-day separation. Another <clears throat> continuation of this same understanding, uh, some depth to this uh, observation, is the matching prophecies of Yahweh's self-imposed silence that would be like a drought of the Word of God. Uh, the mistake is often made in rather oddly presuming the time of God's silence prophesied in Amos and Micah somehow applies to the time between the Old and New Testaments, between Malachi and Matthew. That is an impossible understanding, as we are told exactly when that self-imposed divine silence will end. And it will be at the introduction of the Millennial Kingdom, at the return of Christ, at the time when those latter reigns <coughs> James and Hosea uh, tells us about, and Elijah shadow prophesies, when that prophetic image of 42 and 420 is fulfilled. Amos defines this period of self-imposed divine silence as being a period of no rain, a drought of the Word of God, therefore similar to the 42 months of drought between Elijah's prayers to stop the rain and then begin the rain again. We read of this uh, prophecy in Amos in chapter 8, beginning at verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. We know exactly when this drought of the word of God will end, as we are given that answer by Isaiah. We are still currently within that period of divine silence. We certainly have no prophets and no new revelations of God's word, not since the Holy Spirit gifts ended after the death of that second generation, which was the chronological limit for the gifts, uh, for the promise of the Holy Spirit gifts. This ending of the Holy Spirit gifts of miracles coincided with the last book of the New Testament being completed by John, the book of Revelation. This is exactly what Paul prophesied to the Corinthians, that the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit would end when that which was perfect or complete or mature would come, meaning when the Word of God, the Bible, was finished. There would be no need for miraculous Holy Spirit gifts any longer. Something greater would replace the Spirit gifts in their educational purpose. This is when the period of divine silence began. The rains the word of God from heaven, stopped. That heavenly drought between the early and latter rains began at this point. This is very easy to conclusively prove. prove. Uh, Isaiah tells us exactly when the time of Yahweh's silence will end in the kingdom prophecy in chapter 42. We read in Isaiah 42, starting in verse 13, <clears throat> in the context of a very obvious a millennial kingdom prophecy. Uh, it says, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. Again, uh, Isaiah 42 is a very, very 
obvious prophecy of the restoration of the kingdom of God. This is when God will end his self-imposed silence, when those latter rains identifying the return of Jesus Christ will pour from heaven, when Jesus Christ returns to judge those accountable to his Father's righteousness, to immortalize the saints, fulfilling that second cherubim vision that was 420 days after the first cherubim vision and experienced in the Spirit at Jerusalem. Oh, one might be tempted to ask why Elijah would actually pray for a drought. That would certainly create great hardship and suffering within the enlightened community of his generation. One might further ask why God would actually impose that 42-month drought for the suffering of the enlightened community at Elijah's request. The answer to both of these questions is found in the law of the early and latter rains, presented in Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, beginning at verse 10. <clears throat> and we read, For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt, from whence ye came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land where whither you go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys, and drinks water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God cares for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your corn, your wine, your oil, and I will send grass in your fields for your cattle, that you may eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's be wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. The Creator sculpted the geographic design of the Promised Land to be very different from Egypt. Israel's agricultural process was very much dependent on the rain cycles, described here as the first rain and the latter rains. In that same expression, let's use to define the timestamp of both our Messiah's two comings and the two kingdoms of God. If the enlightened, covenant-bound community refused the words of God, turning away from truth to other gods, then correspondingly, God would withhold the rain, which Yahweh creationally defines as representing his words. God speaks through Moses in Deuteronomy 32, Beginning at the first verse, God says through Moses, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Of course, this is uh, addressing Israel as heaven and earth, as is done frequently throughout Scripture and based in the promises to Abraham, where his descendants would be as the stars of heaven and the dust of the earth. Okay, God says, uh, continuing, My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Isaiah makes the same exact parallel between rain and the word of God that both issue from the heavens. In Isaiah 55, uh, verse 10, we see, For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and returns not thither, but waters the earth, and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So, just as rain is the creational expression of God's words, his testimony, so the two comings of Jesus, <laughs> defined in John 1 as the word made flesh, those two comings are defined as the early and the latter rains. So too, the outpourings of divine testimony are prophetically defined as the early 
and the latter reigns, with the self-imposed divine silence between those early and latter reigns being so appropriately defined as a drought of the word of God. That time between the ending of the Holy Spirit gifts after those two generations to which they were promised, until the return of Christ from heaven, the restoration of the kingdom of God, and Yahweh's going forth like a mighty man, no longer holding his peace and screaming like a charging soldier and like a woman giving birth. The flow of that scriptural expression of the early and the latter reigns with the word of God and the word made flesh and the word revealed in power is absolutely perfect and seamless all through Scripture. So the answer to our question as to why Elijah would pray for the suffering of drought on the children of God and why Yahweh would inflict this particular suffering is that this was the warning against an expected apostasy. If the enlightened community would reject God's words, his testimony, then they would not get the rain they were agriculturally dependent upon. That is the corresponding creational expression of that divine testimony they were rejecting. Drought was a divine corrective measure, the Heavenly Father's discipline, with the intention of prompting a positive behavioral response through an awakening of a deadened fear of God. It is unfortunate that so many in the enlightened community of our own generation similarly discount the fear of God as a legitimate motivation, reducing it to nothing more than a respectful reverence, assuming that either God has somehow changed or we're just so gloriously wonderful in our generation that forget, and, and that forgiveness is so automatic that there's just no need anymore to be afraid of encouraging our Heavenly Father's displeasure. But that's the source of all false understanding and understandings about our Creator's righteousness. This self-worshipping effect issuing from an uncircumcised heart. If we are not afraid of the consequences for encouraging our Heavenly Father's displeasure, we're inviting an inevitable progressive decay in our understandings about the terms of our Creator's righteousness, which is certainly the case in this last generation of the enlightened community just as has been prophesied so many times about us, like how Jesus describes this generation as being so unpalatably lukewarm, he wants, to, he wants to spit us out of his mouth, and how Jesus defines the generation of the enlightened community to which he will return to be like the time of the flood and like the time of Lot. But our initial point of reference was those 42 months during which there was a divinely imposed drought, no rain from heaven, between the two prayers of Elijah. Now let's further emphasize this significance of this 42-month drought in relation to the prophesied drought-like divine silence between the ending of the Holy Spirit gifts and the return of Jesus Christ and the introduction of the Millennial Kingdom. We're told Elijah will personally play a significant role in the restoration of the kingdom of God when those latter reigns are scheduled. The very last words of the Old Testament prophesy of Elijah's role. We read in Malachi 4, starting in verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Jesus responds to his disciples' question about Elijah's preparatory assignment after they witnessed the transfiguration vision, uh, including Elijah, with Moses and Jesus. We read this in Matthew 17, starting in verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall uh, first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, and have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Just as Elijah's 42 months of prayer-induced drought 
highlights that dual aspect of the rain, the early and the latter rains, there's a dual application of this last prophecy, this latter rain prophecy about Elijah. How John the Baptist served as the initial Elijah prophecy, but the prophet will also be personally involved in the second coming of Jesus and the restoration of the kingdom, those latter reigns. The, this prophecy of Elijah's pre-adventural assignment has both an early and latter rain application for Christ's first coming and his second coming. There's a very strong identification of Elijah's 42 months of drought prophetically applying to the time of our Creator's silence between the early and the latter rains, between the two comings of Jesus and between the two immortalization events. Therefore, related to that 420 days between the first and second Caribbean visions Ezekiel experienced, it's the same image of the 42 generations between Abraham and Christ, and the 42 encampments from Egypt to the Promised Land. Each 42 span indicates a partial completeness. The 42nd in each of these series identifies a completion, but not a finality. Additionally, within that time frame of our Creator's drought-like silence, we have the prophecy of the 42-month time frame for the political reign of the Antichrist. We read initially of this, uh, uh, of this coming Antichrist in Daniel 7, starting verse 25, and he shall speak, speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his, his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This, uh, the expression of a time, and then times, and then the dividing of time is interpreted by Dr. Thomas as a time being equivalent uh, with a time being equivalent to a year, the times representing two years, and the dividing of times being equivalent to one half of a year. In other words, a prophetic total of three and a half years, which is, which is 42 months and is also 1260 days. This understanding is confirmed by John's prophecy. In Revelation 13, we also read of that uh, Antichrist power, political office, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. It's very easy to identify this very wide-ranging religious political power with the power to make war that would continue for 42 months, blaspheming God and persecuting the saints. Due to the value of hindsight, it's, it's childishly simple to see the papal office as perfectly satisfying all the prophecies of the Antichrist. I mean, that number 666 applied to the beast, which is a man in verse 18 of this chapter, is identified with the Pope repeatedly. And the papal office did have a geographically based political authority with the capacity to make war for 1260 years, 42 months of years. From the decree of focus in the year 606, which granted political authority to the Christian bishop at Rome, giving him authority to command armies and collect taxes until that emperor-like status was lost in 1866, exactly 1200 and 60 years later. A time, two times, and a half time. 42 months of years. <laughs> In response to this humiliation, uh, this loss of 
emperor-like status and the capacity to collect taxes and impose the papal will through making war, we see the papal declaration of infallibility being publicly proclaimed on July 18, 1870. It is truly fascinating to read the accounts of that infallibility declaration. Now, here's a quote from a book entitled The Global Vatican, and I quote, Just as the council had commenced with inclement weather in December 1869, so it climaxed six months later, on the morning of July 18th, 1870. Sheets of rain ripped across St. Peter's Square. Bolts of lightning ruptured the dark sky over the basilica as thunder rattled the windows. Inside, the bishops gathered under flickering candles to cast their votes on infallibility. The motion passed by an overwhelming majority. Its opponents, having either come around to support it or in some cases stayed away to avoid casting a ballot, just two bishops voted against it. It should also be understood that the very next day, the Franco-Prussian War began requiring the withdrawal of the French troops protecting the Vatican, leaving, leaving it completely exposed to the Italian troops threatening the Vatican. This is how the world reported this development, uh, quoting from the same book. The world's reaction to the Pope's temporal downfall was mixed. In the United States, newspapers registered conflicting, uh, conflicted feelings. Quote, the great scandal of the ages is wiped out, exalted one New Hampshire journal, and the deeds of violence, blood, and shame enacted by an ecclesiastical prince are to be known no more except in history, by another newspaper. Other papers carried reports of anguished Catholics congregating to protest the spoilation of the Pope's domain under a monster demonstration in Philadelphia and a march of 5,000 in Covington, Kentucky to condemn the usurpation. Not all Catholics were sorry to see the Pope's temporal power end. Many viewed the loss of Rome as a blessing in disguise, believing in the words of the New York Times that the Pope as head of the Christian world should be much more powerful than in his capacity as the sovereign of Rome. An editorial in the Times put it this way, Pope, Paul the Ninth, Pope, Pi I'm sorry, Pope Pius IX as simple head of the Catholic Church, will be a greater man than he who combined the office with the kingship of a small, badly governed, governed and disaffected territory. That kingship, that political authority, and the capacity to make war lasted 1260 years. 1260 is the total number of days in 42 months, based on the Jewish lunar calendar, Using the divinely provided prophetic tool of assigning a year for a day, as God told Ezekiel to do, we can see why the Antichrist papal office was limited to exactly 1260 years, within that period of our Creator's self-imposed silence, those 42 months of drought between the early and the latter rains. So we have this pattern of 42, representing a full maturity from beginning to end, for a particular maturing process, but not a finality. This is even true of the 1260-year limit of the Antichrist's political authority. Yes, the Pope was stripped of his emperor status in 1866, but the papacy still continues and still enjoys some influence. There was a minimal restoration of papal land, uh, Vatican City, that was supplied by the fascist Mussolini, World War II, just before World War II, in exchange for the papacy supporting that fascists rise to power in Italy. I mean, similarly, the papacy openly supported the Nazis in Germany before and during World War II. But we'll see the Antichrist's office again, uh, this office of the papacy, active again in the opposition of Jesus Christ when he returns to ascend the throne of his ancestor, King David, at Jerusalem. Therefore, that limit of 42 months for the Antichrist political and military power that runs between the first and second immortalization events also satisfies the understanding of a completion, but a somewhat incomplete completion, like that half week 
uh, ministry of our Messiah, those three and a half years, those 42 months. So God uses this number 42 in the same context in several applications, including those 10 sets of 42 days running between the Ezekiel's first and second cherubim visions, projecting the first and second immortalizations in our Creator's plan. I expect the fact that there are 10 times 42 in this 420 differential between the two immortalization shadow visions of Ezekiel would be an emphasis tool. Not just 42 days, but 10 times 42 days. The three specific timestamps for Ezekiel's three cherubim visions are rich with significance, but exclusively for those within the enlightened community exercising seeing eyes and hearing ears, being enabled by a circumcised heart. In our next Visions of the Kingdom Age presentation, we'll look at the four square frame for that first cherubim vision in Ezekiel chapter 1. There's a whirlwind, an infolding fire, a cloud, and a brightness that all serve to frame this vision, paralleling the four square wilderness configuration of the enlightened community. Interestingly, these four creational components all share a scriptural association with the promise of immortalization, which is exactly what the three cherubim visions are shadow projecting.